to death. Beth, we're so happy to have you here with us this evening um, to talk about entomophagy. Am I saying that correctly? And entomophagy. <laughs> I, had been, I had trained my brain the wrong way. I know. That's, entomophagy. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been saying entomophagy for so for the longest time. Well, well, I say entomophagy. So, you know, tomato, tomato, you can do okay. what you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as I said, um, Beth is joining us from the University of Maryland um, uh, Extension Service, and here she is. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for asking me to be a part of your evening tonight. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I hope you weren't expecting a research presentation because you're not going to get one. This is going to be a little bit more fun um, and a little bit um, more on, on the surface of knowledge, um, which is where, where I seem to do best. Um, uh, my background is in entomology. I went to the University of Delaware, uh, but I've been a 4-H educator in Maryland now for 28 years. Um, or 26, and I was nutrient management before that. So I've been with the university for quite a while, um, and I've been doing insect programming the whole time and even before I came to the university. So I'm happy to be here and talk to you about one of the programs that I do. So I am gonna do a PowerPoint presentation. And well, if we could go backwards, there we go. So um, I'm delighted to, to be here this evening and uh, talk to you about entomophagy, which is one of the relatively new areas of, of, of insects that I started maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, my interest in, in entomology is really working with people and how they relate to insects in their environment. And we relate to insects in all kinds of ways, from medical to um, pollination, to the food we eat. There are just so many ways to the pests that are in our home um, or infest our pets. Um, insects are everywhere. And so my goal is to get people to just be a little bit more familiar with the insects around them and maybe appreciate what they do a little bit more. But when we start talking about entomophagy, that's even a greater relationship with insects. So we're gonna, that's what we're gonna kind of dive into today. So I don't know if this cookie is in your future, but let's dive in and see where we are. So entomophagy, what it actually is it? Um, it's really the practice of human beings eating insects. And that is a little bit different um, than we think of in nature because, um, let me get my screen working here. There we go. Um, us, human beings eating insects has been around for a long time but it's not something that we always um, are thinking of when we think of the food that we eat. What we do think of though, when we think of insects in the environment is other animals eating them. And we don't call them uh, entomophagists or anything like that. We call them insectivores. Insectivores are animals in our environment that are non-human that consume insects. So I've given you one of my favorite examples on the screen, the big brown bat, which um, this picture comes from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. If you don't visit their wildlife heritage um, site, I highly recommend it, it's fantastic. Um, but this is one of my favorite insectivores. All the 10 species of bats in Maryland are all insect feeders. Can anyone name another insectivore in the environment or several other ones that you can think of? Opossum. Say that again. Opossum. Opossum, yep, they'll, they'll eat, they're kind of omnivorous. They'll eat a lot of things, but yes, insects for sure. Anybody else have any other suggestions? Many songbirds. Bird. Songbirds, certainly. At least in a portion of their, of their year. Most of the time our insects eat other things or our birds eat other things, but certainly during the rearing of their young, 
they become almost exclusively insectivores. Anything else? Toad. I'm sorry. Toad. Oh yes, for sure. Okay, so we have lots of animals in our environment that eat insects and they eat them because they have nutritional value and they're gonna give something to their recipient. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about how insects can actually influence our own human diet. So I'm not sure that this is in our future um, as the waiter gives us our, our food and it's all insects on a platter or that we actually go into a restaurant and order food that has insects on the menu. <laughs> or even we'll go to the beach and order an insect snack. This is actually how I think we are going to see insects in our future. When they are blended with other foods to make other foods like protein bars and crackers and um, uh, other products that are going to be, they're not gonna look like insects, in other words. This is how I think we're gonna, at least in the initial stages, this is definitely how we're gonna see insects in our diet. However, I think the urgency is gonna come because of a cartoon like this. If you can't tell, I like cartoons. Um, and so I think this is where we may be headed as we deal with climate change and increasing human population on the planet, we still have a need for protein and other nutrients. And so I think we are going to be turning to insects as a source of that protein in the future, where we, I don't think we're gonna to totally get rid of, uh, of animal protein and, uh, and plant-based proteins, of course, are gonna be part of our diet, but this is a way that we can supplement or replace some of our protein in our diet with something that can be sustainable. So where does the research take us? I am not gonna go through all of this. I'm just kind of gonna put this up there for you guys to look at some of the areas that research is heading. And it's all over the place. The problem is, is because we don't have a whole lot of research on insects and human, um, insects and food for humans. So there's a lot of research being done and there's a lot of research to go. <laughs> and, it, and it kind of revolves around two areas. We look, um, the food systems are our whole food systems and certainly this pandemic has shed a light on our current food systems, but how are insects going to mesh into the food systems that we have? Do we need to change them? What are the big overall pictures as we, as we mass produce insects in the future? But then the palatability, the marketing, how are we as humans going to take insects as part, as part of our food source? So there is a lot of research going on in all of these areas. There's even been a couple conferences. Insects to Feed the World um, had two conferences in the past few years in 2014 and 2018, which brought together all kinds of researchers and specialists really looking at insects as food. Um, and there's all kinds of journals. Believe me, this is just a couple of journals that um, are publishing and looking and funding research um, to help look at the situation of, of insects and food, including the Journal of Insects of, of as food and feed. So we're not only just looking at it as sources of food for us as humans, but also for animal feeds as well. And isn't that a great picture? Um, because this is a global issue. Um, we may think of it as a new and emerging issue here in the United States or in Europe, but this is a global issue and insect eating has been around for thousands of years. Well, what do I do? Okay, so I'm actually a 4-H educator, which means I'm in a county office. I don't work at College Park. I go to College Park just occasionally. I'm not a researcher there. I'm an educator. So I work with ch the children in my county on uh, a lot of insect issues. I don't do all insect issues. We have a very uh, traditional 4-H based program in my county. 
And um, so I do a lot of animal things. I do all kinds of stuff. But when I get to do my insect programming, this is where I am. I do a lot of basic insect education from pollinators to um, just basic overall insects and diversity in their environment, how, how we relate to insects. But I, and it's mostly with kids, but also with adults. And that's me in the bottom right-hand corner teaching a, uh, an all-day insect class to a master naturalist program here on the shore. So I saw somebody said they were a master naturalist. Um, so somebody taught them their insect section. Um, but I have a lot of fun um, teaching adults as well. But what I really love to do is work with kids. And so we get them out collecting, we get them making insect collections of their own, um, learning the scientific names, learning how to place them in their insect order groups and things like that, and doing um, collecting correctly. So one of the newer programs that I've been working on, of course, um, when, you, when you want to emphasize insect-human relationships is how can people help insects in their environment? So building mason bee um, houses was one of the things we started a few years ago. And I've partnered with our horticulture specialist uh, in our county to do quite a few programs. Again, from the library to our middle school, to this is the one the group there in the middle is a church youth group. Um, so at our middle school, we placed over 20 um, Mason Bee houses. They have a community garden there and they have worked phenomenally. And we, we built them ourselves using recycled materials and invasive plants, Phragmites and bamboo, and they've worked wonderfully. But I also have a passion for the arts and creativity. Um, I like cartoons myself, um, but I like to see kids be creative and insects can be a huge inspiration for creativity. Uh, so I also work with art classes. This is an art class, um, the top picture for a summer arts program, as well as our Kent County High School um, art class where the kids had to use insects as inspiration for pencil drawings and you can see the wing that this one young lady artist was working on while I was there. Just an absolute phenomenal drawing that she was working on. So insects can have a lot of interaction with human beings and we don't always think, we think of some of the normal stuff, but these are other ways that we can interact with humans as well. But when I do entomophagy, how do I start? How do I get kids excited about it? Why is it even important? So I always, always start, and this uh, I do this with most of my insect programs, about looking at insects and their numbers worldwide on our planet. And so I like pie charts because pie charts tell you a lot um, and they're easy for kids to understand. And they convey a lot of information in, in, in a simple way. So I like this pie chart because it's pretty, it has nice pictures, but it also is very, very clear that the majority of the pie is being taken up by 925,000 different named insect species, okay? And everything else takes a smaller part of that pie. I also, okay, so 58% of that pie chart is being taken up by insects. But I also like this one. These are my two favorite. I like percentages as well, because percentages also tell, they don't give you the raw numbers like the one on the left did, but they give some percentages and those are clear numbers to kids. They can see that 22% of the species on the planet are, are beetles. Um, and that makes them the most numerous thing on the planet um, as far as the number of species. When you start adding insects together on this pie chart, you get 59% of the species on our planet are insects, not just arthropods, just insects. So that makes them, to me, very, very important, um, just on sheer numbers. Um, not just, and also you, then you add in their importance to us and our everyday life, and insects become a really important topic of discussion. 
So how many of those many, many species do we actually eat? Well, according to uh, this researcher who published a, a study in the ecology of food and nutrition, we have about 2000 recorded different edible insects in the world, okay? Um, so there's a lot of them and there's even more, okay? Um, these are just the ones they've actually recorded that people have eaten and, and tested across the world. So what does that look like? Well, here's a picture of an open air market in Bangkok, in Thailand. And this would be a way that regular folks could go shopping for their food and their protein. And the, some of the items listed there that they could buy, and these are all fried. So this was, this stand had fried insects, um, but they have locusts, which are a type of grasshopper, bamboo worms, moth chrysalises, so they're big ones, um, right there. Those are the moth chrysalises right there. Crickets, scorpions, which are arthropods, but not insects, diving beetles and giant water beetles. So you could go and you could purchase these for your meal. Um, and that's, this is a, a regular normal occurrence in other parts of the world. All right. Why did we lose my picture? <laughs> you want to stop sharing and then come back on? I think I'm going to have to. Sorry okay. about that, guys. No problem. That's, that's <laughs> what we live in. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So when you go ahead and look at all the insects that we're eating, this is how we break them down. This is um, what the FAO or the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is part a part of the United Nations, does a lot of work on entomophagy and the insects that are eaten around the world. So this is an FAO um, graphic looking at the breakdown of the different groups of insects that are eaten across the world. And as you can see, not only are beetles the most numerous number of species, but they are also the most numerous in what human beings eat in their insect diet. Next is caterpillars. Um, so all those Lepidoptera larvae that birds and other things also like to eat, there's a reason, they're nutritious. Um, and so they are number two. Then we get down to ants, bees, and wasps. We think of chocolate covered ants and bee brood as, as food. Well, they're third and then down to grasshoppers and locusts and crickets. So when you put those four different groups of insects together, that is the majority of what we are eating ac around the world. There's a few other smaller groups um, like flies and dragonflies and termites um, and cicadas but those aren't the majority. Your, your, your big amount is right here in these four insect groups. Okay, this is another FAO um, document that I think is, is very interesting. Um, this is the top part of it. And again, if you are interested in having some of these documents, you can Google them yourself as well. Um, but this is called Grab Some Grub. This is an FAO document looking at where insects are eaten around the world and how many. So this is the top part of it, looking at the areas in the world that have the heaviest insect eating. And so if you look, the darker colors, the darker purpley pink or purple color are where the most insects are eaten. So when we think about the United States, North America and Europe as probably the least areas where insects are eaten, look at where one of the highest concentrations is, right to our south. Um, Mexico is one of the two areas of the world that eats more than 300 different types of insects in their population. So Mexico is a huge consumer of different insect species in their diet. And this is mostly native populations. The second, uh, area in the world that's heaviest in insect eaters, over 300 different types, 
is Eastern Asia, okay? Um, and then you can see they get a little bit lighter from there, but you're still talking anywhere from 50 to 300 different species are eaten in those areas of the world. So we're looking at South America, Southern Africa, most of Asia, and even in Australia. Um, so we have a very diverse area of the world that are regular consumers of insects already in their diet. So when we take a look at those insects and their nutri nutritional value, then how does it all compare? Well, I know this is pretty small, so I'm just gonna highlight three out of this group and compare them to some of our regular protein sources. So based on a hunt, um, they have the kilograms there of protein and fat in some of our normal sources. So like a steak, pork, chicken, tuna, tofu, and how much protein and how much fat is in that 85 kilograms. When you start looking at the insects then in comparison, how do they, how do they compare? Well, we have mealworms. And there's a reason I picked mealworms because you're going to hear a lot more about them. Mealworms have a nutty shrimp flavor if you want to just eat them plain. Um, but they can be used in many different ways. So boiled, sauteed, roasted, or fried. You're going to hear more about that. And then when you look at those um, uh, nutritional breakdowns per 100 grams, you're going to get 20 grams of protein and 13 grams of fat. And that's a little high on the fat. You compare it to some of our other sources. When you bring in the locust, which is what we tend to really think of as a food, as a food source across the world, 18 grams of, of protein and 21 grams of fat. And it's really dependent on which species it is. Um, and if you look at grasshoppers and crickets, they're a lot lower, but locusts have a lot of fat. And if you, you probably, if you, if you think really hard, you can figure it out. Locusts are a swarming species. So they accumulate a lot of fat because they travel. Um, and so they, they are a little bit higher in fat content. But looking at our caterpillars, some of those are the most nutritious. They are lower in fat, 2.6 grams, but a little higher in protein. So 12 grams per uh, 100 grams of of content. So this particular uh, caterpillar uh, is popular in South Africa. They eat 9.5 billion worms per year. That's a lot of caterpillars that are getting eaten in one year. Um, so caterpillars are a big source. Um, they were second as far as the percentage in the number of uh, insect species eaten worldwide. But it's not just across the world that we're looking at different um, insects and their nutritional value. This is uh, from a study at Iowa State, uh, right here in the United States, looking at crickets. Crickets are already a food source here in the United States. Um, they have converted uh, farmers who, who were pet cricket producers into human grade uh, cricket producers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of that food in a little bit. But here's the nutritional value. And, and the nice thing is it's in, it's in a format that we're used to seeing. This is the same nutritional uh, facts that you see on all the food, manufactured food that you see in the United States. It has to be there by law. So very nicely, you can see clearly, again, on 100 grams, which is a serving size um, of crickets, you're going to get 122 calories and 50 calories from fat. And then you look there, 5.5 grams. So a little, a little bit less than you saw when we were looking at the locusts. Crickets don't have quite as much fat, but they do have plenty of um, protein, calcium, and iron. Look at the iron. Um, insects are going to potentially be a really good sense, a source of iron in the future. So back to the FAO, because again, they do a lot of, of um, work with, with insects uh, feeding the world. So this is another FAO um, graphic, just showing some comparisons. 
between grasshoppers and beef. And beef is something, if you, unless you're a vegetarian or don't eat beef, it's probably something we all consume at least a little bit of. So how do the two compare? So if you're looking at a grasshopper and a cow or a beef steer, based on that 100 grams of um, ground beef or 100 grams of grasshopper, you're gonna get a little more calories from, from the beef, 271 a little less from the grasshopper, 153 calories per 100 grams. You're gonna get a little bit more protein, not significantly more. You're gonna get less fat from your grasshopper, much more calcium. Think about that exoskeleton because they're grinding that up and that's gonna go in as part uh, where you're not getting the bones typically from a steer where's where the calcium is you're getting that exoskeleton from the insect because it's ground up in powder as part of the flour. And you're also getting increased iron. Now, how does it compare when you look at the environmental issues? So when you produce one kilogram of protein, whether it's a cow, and now we're gonna look at it comparison to mealworms, greenhouse gas emissions, you can see are much less when you have an insect source, in this case, a mealworm, versus trying to produce that one kilogram of beef, okay? A lot less from 80 to 170 kilograms to produce one kilogram of protein to 20 kilograms for the mealworm. So much more efficient. The energy issues are not that much different. Um, they're about the same, but then look at the amount of land. So you need 145 to 260 square meters to grow one kilogram of protein for a, for a steer and only 20 square meters for a mealworm. So again, when you're looking at feeding an increased population and potentially smaller land masses and uh, due to climate change, this may be something that puts insects favorably as a protein source in the future. Now, ironically, I'm going to tell you, I live on my husband's family farm here in Kent County. He was a dairy farm forever, uh, for many, many years. Now we have a beef herd. So here, here is the stark contrast. We have a herd of beef, um, you know, and I don't think beef is going away anytime soon. Neither is chicken or pork. Um, but looking at the future with tightening resources and tightening environmental condition, conditions, I do think this is going to kind of force insect insects to become more of our uh, regular diet. And we will probably be eating less of those other protein sources in the future. Now, that's a lot of words and you don't have to read it. Um, I just wanted to show you, oops. <coughs> When I was deciding to do my first entomophagy program quite a few years ago, I was trying to decide which species and which insect I really wanted to be a part of my program. And I didn't wanna just go buy cricket lollipops or whatever. I wanted kids to really get their hands into it and I wanted to cook them our, ourselves. So how was I gonna be able to do this? Well, in my research and looking up, I found this article, which was written by a lady who was actually commenting on a insect restaurant that used to be in New York City. It has since gone out of business, um, but they served insects on the menu. And in the course of her article talking about that, um, she started talking um, to this professor from Purdue, Dr. Tom Turpin, and he was talking about mealworms. Now he was also talking about a couple other insect groups, but this is what I latched onto. The cool thing about mealworms is they are easy to grow. And I've had a colony for 10 years um, that I've kept going here at my house. Um, I use them all the time for lots of different things, not just entomophagy, but they are a great source of food. And I have them right here. You're gonna get to see a couple of them in a, in a couple minutes. Um, but the cool things about mealworms is they have a lot of positive qualities for entomophagy. They're easy to grow, so you can grow them and, and easy to cook. They tend to take on the flavor of the food that they eat or the food you cook them with. So 
I raise my mealworms and I'm going to show them to you in, right now. I, I use my meal, I raise my mealworms on um, rolled oats and potatoes. And the reason I use rolled oats and potatoes, the um, mealworms are the larval form of the darkling beetle. And the darkling beetle is a grain uh, feeder. That's all they eat. But they also need a, uh, the potatoes are in there for their um, water source. They still need some moisture to add to their diet. Um, so potatoes work great. You can use apples or carrots or other things as well. But I, I did use, um, I almost lost my whole colony at the beginning because I was using apples and apples mold much more quickly. Um, potatoes just dry out without molding. And so if they don't eat them right away, you're not gonna end up with a problem and that mold can kill your insects. So I've had this colony in a tub for 10 years. They just keep recycling themselves. Um, and so it's worked great. That means I had a ready source whenever I wanted to do this program. And so not only that, but I had a live colony that I could always bring with me to my programs. They could see and interact with the insects. So um, then after getting over what, what species is how do I get over teaching kids and adults, do I eat it or do I not eat it? And that whole idea of, ew, it's a bug. Ew, it's an insect. I don't want to eat that. Um, so I came up with a plan. We eat some very high priced arthropods. My nephew is a chef. And these are um, some soft shell crabs that he made a couple months ago for my family. I can't eat them. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec, but he made these soft shell crabs. Soft shell crabs are expensive. Insects and soft shell crabs are very similar. They're all arthropods. So by connecting those kids to the insects that they were gonna eat, to something that they were already familiar with, soft shells or hard crabs, here in the Chesapeake region, this is the premier seafood in our state. So by comparing the two and saying you're okay with eating one, now you can be okay with eating the other because they're both arthropods. They're actually closely related. Of course, um, crabs, lobsters, shrimp spend most of their time in the water and they tend to be bigger but our insects are terrestrial and they're a little smaller. But other than that, they're very, very closely related and they're very similar as far as nutrition. Okay, so obviously you're gonna get more with a crab because you only need one crab to make a lot. Um, you would need more insects, but the, but the idea is the same. And if we're willing to spend a whole lot for one, why are we so unwilling to do the other, to eat the other. So that's how I base my premise whenever I do an entomophagy program, because right away you can dispel all of that ew, because they're already eating something that's very closely related to insects in the first place. So whenever I do an entomophagy program, I always let the kids play with the colony. I let them hold the larvae. They get to look at the pupas. Um, play with the beetles and so that they can see, cause that's where the food that they're gonna eat in a few minutes is gonna come from. It's coming from that live colony that they can now touch and see and know where their food is gonna come from. Then we make the step of actually cooking the mealworms. Um, if they're older kids, they can do it themselves. If they're younger kids, they, they just get to watch. But I do not take live mealworms out of my colony and put them in the saucepan. Um, I do take um, a group of mealworms out of the colony, usually about 24 hours beforehand, and I freeze them. 
which is a very um, non horrible way uh, to euthanize your um, your poor mealworms. They just go to sleep in the freezer and never wake up. Um, so I, I do that when I insect collect too, I freeze everything. Um, so you can freeze them for about 24 hours that will ensure that they are dead. If you only do it for a couple hours, they might come back to life because um, they're pretty hardy uh, in cold temperatures. But they, if you keep them in there about that 24 hours, then you can go ahead and cook them. Now that means they're frozen. They're frozen mealworms and they still have a lot of moisture in them. So I saute everything. So we put a little bit of butter in the pan. We heat up a, a, a hot plate there, get the pan nice and hot. And I throw in the mealworms. Well, of course, what are they gonna do? In butter, they're gonna spit. They're gonna, they look like they're moving. They're not. It's just the moisture um, um, contacting with the heat and the, and the butter. And so it makes it a little bit more exciting. And, you know, so you grab everyone's attention for sure when you start cooking mealworms um, this way. So sauteing them, that was one of the methods that you can do it. They come out nice and crunchy um, and they're, they're good for eating. <laughs> so how do people react when you get them to try and eat mealworms? Well, there's a variety of reactions as you might, as you might guess. Um, some are very willing, some are a little bit more not quite so sure. I do, I threw a couple of adults in here. This is my colleague from Worcester County. Um, and she was, she was right in on it. She's a military person. She was in the military and earlier in her career. She's like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. This is, our, this is one of our youth librarians from, from our library. She tried them as well. And then we have the kids. They have all kinds of reactions from gagging sometimes. Um, he actually ate it, that's my son, um, when he was younger. Um, to kids who are just willing to just try it. Now, I will say every now and then you do get kids that don't want to. They, they will say, I, I just don't want to try it. They'll watch, they'll, but they won't try them. But I, I would guess that about 90% of the time, youth and adults will try the, the mealworm that, that they've been a part of cooking or watching being cooked. Um, and they will at least try a bite. It's amazing how many of them will come back for more. So that's exciting. They are now seeing insects in their environment in a new way. And that's what I, that's my goal. Whenever I do an insect program, I want people to see insects that around them in a new way. And so when you are eating an insect, that really, that totally changes the relationship even from somebody who likes to watch pollinators in their yard and have a great feeling about insects. When you say you're gonna start eating them, that changes that relationship. And so I like to try and get people to think a little bit differently and maybe have that relationship change a little bit. Well, it's coming folks. Um, this was just a quick search. Um, I, I highlight, I'm highlighting chapel um, because they, this, this fellow that started this company is from Utah. He's actually a geologist looking at water conservation. So how in the world did he start an insect uh, food company? Well, because he was very concerned um, about land use in his state, which you think about Utah is a lot of dry country. He was look and looking and very concerned about water use in the whole Midwest, not just even in Utah. And he realized how much less water inputs and land inputs that insects need to grow the same amount of protein. And that's how he got started with his company. In fact, he presented it on Shark Tank. And I got to see him at Washington College a few years ago when he came there for a whole, they did a whole week on, on entomophagy at the college and I got to see him talk. It was very interesting. So here's somebody who had a totally different science, science focus, a geologist looking at water who ended up as with insects as food. So that's his company. They make um, uh, cricket powders and protein bars and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so you can find them online. Here's another one, Entolife. Um, roasted crickets in all kinds of flavor. 
go for it. Cotton candy, roasted crickets. I don't know that that's up my alley, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so there's all kinds of flavors there um, that you can try. You can even get a bug box. I mean, there's tea of the month, there's socks of the month, but did you know that there's bug of the month too? You can get an insect related food once a month delivered to your door, <laughs> who knew? Um, and there's a whole, this is a whole website just looking at products made from insects. Um, and cricket flowers, that's the offshoot of Chapel and their flower division. He's the one who worked on converting um, farmers who were grown to mass produce crickets for food consumption. He was the one who worked with uh, farmers who were creating, who were growing crickets for the pet trade, for lizards and other things that eat crickets and got these farmers to convert to food grade, which wasn't that difficult. So then they, free, they freeze their uh, insects as well and then grind them into a powder and that's where their cricket flower comes from. So you can do the chocolate covered ants, you can do the flavored uh, crickets and mealworms. And in fact, I have some that I bring to programs. I have a chocolate covered scorpion um, that I show kids, but this is more where it's at, okay? So you can get that novelty stuff, but this is gonna be more of what we're look, gonna be seeing, I think, in the future. Now I do at this point wanna mention the allergy part. Um, because I am in particular, I'm going to have to be very careful in the future. I do have a shellfish allergy, so I cannot eat crabs or shrimp or lobsters or crayfish um, that have an exoskeleton. Well, insects have an exoskeleton as well. They are closely related to our aquatic shellfish. So I have tried them earlier in my uh, career. Um, and I sat there ready with my Benadryl, but I am not willing to try that anymore because um, my allergy has gotten worse. So I will never eat insects again. Um, I have in my past and I've tried them so I can say I've done it, but I can't anymore. And that is something that you have to be very careful of if you are doing entomophagy programs. You wanna make sure that anybody there who, who is going to try an insect does not have a shellfish allergy. I ask them if they eat crabs or shrimp or lobster. If they eat any of those, they will be fine. If they don't know, I will sometimes recommend that they not try them. I don't wanna be their test case on whether they have a shellfish allergy or not. So keep that in mind. That is one thing I have to be wary of. And as we transfer into uh, an insect protein based uh, food source in the future, I'm gonna to have to be wary, just like people who have a gluten um, sensitivity have to watch for gluten in their diet. I'm gonna to have to watch for this because I, I honestly think the way Chapel has done it in the powder form and being added into food to supplement and boost the protein into foods we already eat is what's gonna happen, at least in the initial phases, phases as we get um, people in North America and Europe used to eating insects regularly. Um, I don't think you're gonna see this. <laughs> um, Cause I always show this to kids and I'm like, yeah, how would you like this for lunch? Um, no, they really don't. They don't want mealworms and grasshoppers in their salad. Um, and so this may be a little bit farther off. I'm not saying it's not gonna happen because just like anything else, if you put a crab over top of that, you would probably pay a lot of money for it. Um, so it's all in the perception and what we are used to, the cultural relevances, um, sometimes it's religious, and that's all part of research that's going into seeing how palatable insect um, eating is going to be in the future, um, because some of it is cultural. And certainly we have grown up here in the United States with insects not being a regular part of our diet, at least that we're aware of. I heard a couple of the folks talking before we actually started about how you accidentally um, eat insects when you're riding your bicycle or something like that. You open your mouth and they fly in and you can't get them out and you just swallow them. Well, that's one way that you accidentally get insects in your diet. We also eat them regularly in processed food. Um, the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, 
has insect level criteria in everything from peanut butter to um, canned peaches and everything else. There is a level of insect parts that could be in all of your food. So it's already there. And even if you eat food out of your garden, you're gonna eat a little bit of dirt, you're gonna eat a little bit of insect parts and things like that along with your food. So we're doing it, we just don't realize it. This is gonna put insect um, and entomophagy in the forefront. So I wanna thank the Natural History Society of Maryland for asking me to come. I hope this is sort of along the lines of where you wanted to be when we talked about entomophagy. And somebody asked me at the beginning, if we would have been doing this live, would we have been eating some? And I'm like, yes, for sure. Um, if you ever get the opportunity or you know somebody who has a mealworm colony, try it yourself. And you'll, you'll quickly realize that this is something that can easily fit into your diet. And mealworms especially, they just get crispy. And when you saute them in butter, they taste like butter. They don't have any flavor other than what, what they're cooked in. Mine eat oatmeal and, and potatoes, which have no flavor. So they don't have a whole lot of flavor. Um, so that's why I cook mine in butter. And I always ask the kids, I'm like, so what does it taste like? And they always tell me popcorn. That's what I get. Number one is popcorn um, <laughs> or butter. <laughs> so I do wanna thank you very, very much for your attention tonight and for the opportunity uh, to be with you. Beth, thank you so much for sharing uh, your information with us. Oh, um, I did. Wanna, I did want to share one other thing because a fellow asked about um, insects that we can eat in Maryland. Yeah. So I didn't put that as part of my slideshow, but I do have a handout because I've done several survival camps. So I kind of show some kids what are some insects that they can eat. These are just white grubs from anything from June beetles to Japanese beetles. Any of the scarab beetles have grubs that look like this. You can eat these guys like crazy. They are very nutritious. And anybody who has chickens, they will eat these things like nutso because they are wonderful to eat. These are not mealworms. These are wireworms, which are um, another beetle larvae that eat things like corn and, and plant roots. So just digging in the soil, you would find them. Grasshoppers, we have this, the, this grasshopper here. Caterpillars, um, moth larvae. Um, this is a sphinx moth larva that would, you know, certainly you could eat. But there are a few things you want to avoid too. <laughs> Not everything is edible. Um, but if you try it, you're probably going to hurt yourself. And so here are some of the ones you want to avoid. Saddleback caterpillar and the puss caterpillar both have stinging hairs. There are parts of... Um, a group of caterpillars that, that do um, sting. They have poison um, in, in their hairs that shoots out when they're touched. So that's not a good idea to eat that. Um, <laughs> here's our monarch butterfly caterpillar. Again, it, it feeds on a plant that is um, gonna cause nerve damage. So not, not one you wanna eat. If you eat one, you're probably not gonna do a whole lot. But one isn't going to solve your hunger problem if you're stuck in the wild and you need to eat something. Um, so don't eat those. Warning coloration is a really, really great clue. If it is black, orange, yellow, and you know, uh, red, it's probably telling you there's a reason you don't want to be near it. This is the um, velvet ant, which is actually a wingless wasp. And she does pack a sting too. So you don't want to pick her up and you don't want to eat her either. Um, so you want to be careful about some of these and that, of course, the adult monarch. But most everything else in Maryland, you could probably eat if you had to. If you were su stuck somewhere and starving, um, these would be foods, especially these ones on the top. These guys are definitely ones that you could eat if you needed to. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Yeah, Beth, there was a, you had mentioned earlier on in your in your presentation about um, the difference between um, I, the crickets that are grown for animals or or for pet stores and for yep. human, for human. Could you could you talk about the difference between those two and and how they're they're reared differently? 
Actually, there's not a whole lot different. Um, they just had to um, upgrade their facilities a little bit because as you think about it, if you're raising crickets for um, the lizard pet trade, which is a lot of where they go to, um, they, their criteria for cleanliness and things like that is not gonna be quite as high as if you were raising a cricket for human consumption. So you wanna keep some of those, uh, it's basically a cleanliness factor. They didn't change a whole lot as far as the production. These guys were raising a lot of crickets um, in, in warehouse type facilities. And that is one of the concerns as we look to insects as food is how are we gonna be able to produce it in mass numbers in a human consumption way? Um, so they can do it, They've do, they're doing it already. It's just, they're gonna need to look at that a little bit depending on those species. I think they have it pretty much down for crickets. And it's, it's, I guess it's the same for the mealworm because you're just doing that at home. There's no, no, nothing special that you're doing to raise those mealworms to make them no. safe for human consumption versus to feed no. chickens with. No, it's, it's, it's usually a cleanliness thing. They just wanna be more human grade versus a, a little bit less attentive. Um, the thing about mealworms though, is they're extremely slow growing. So they're not gonna be the answer to all of our protein issues. Crickets, grasshoppers, and other things are much more fast growing. Mealworms have to go through up to 32 exoskeleton sheds where a cricket only goes through four to five at most. Um, so yeah, you, there's, gonna, there's gonna be issues if we're relying on mealworms for our food, but they're an excellent source. They're just a little too slow growing. That's you why they're so have, expensive if you feed them to your birds. Right, and you don't have to, to clean them, like put them in salt water to get them to clean their intestines out before you eat them or anything like that. You can, you can um, take them out of food for 24 hours if you don't want anything in there, but I don't. I just pull them right out of my colony and freeze them. Okay, well, along with that, um, there's, there is the, what kind of... Um, quality control because some Jerry mentioned that some of the grasshopper snacks from Mexico um, have been linked with lead contamination. I don't know if you've heard about that. There are no, but I, that wouldn't surprise me. I think that's pretty much true of all the food sources that you're going to go for. You want to look and look into it carefully and make sure you're getting them from reputable companies. Uh, when you grow them yourself, you know where they come from and what they've eaten, um, the facilities they've been raised in. Um, and that's true of all of our food sources from around the world. So you just want to be careful. And when you take them out um, uh, of the freezer, these are the mealworms. Yes. Um, so for, is it better to do them fresh or uh, 24 to 48 hours before? Does it, does it matter? It doesn't. No, I take the, uh, when I go do a program, I put them in the night before or the day before. I did get them out in the morning when I'm ready to go to work. Um, and I put them in a cooler with an ice pack so that they stay cold all day um, or whenever my class is that day. Um, and I just keep them on ice um, or in the refrigerator if I can. Um, and they, they stay that way. So it can be frozen or, or thawed. That's okay. Either one is fine. Sorry, I missed, I, I, I did the, <laughs> the question was how long can they, they could have, they be stored in the freezer for before and, and be good to use. Oh, you can keep them for, for months. You just want them sealed, just like you would anything else in your freezer. If you leave them in your freezer and they, um, they're not in a sealed container, um, they will dry out just like everything else and they'll fall apart. Uh, and two kind of connected things. One is Mila Weeks did not get to see your mealworms, if you could show those again. Sure. And um, do you have a model that you use for setting up a mealworm farm at your house? Um, you know, literally what I did, I just bought um, a one of the containers that you get can get in the store, a plastic container. And all I did was cut squares in the in the lid that goes on top and put screening in it. And that's all I did um, and dump the, the, I have to clean it 
I, so you still have to clean it um, because they they do produce frass and they are going to consume the oatmeal as you go along. Um, but other than that, they're they're pretty they're very low maintenance. There's not they're not like a dog or a cat or anything like that. So here we go. Um, let me get them in my screen here. My beetles walking away. So let me get them. Here we go. Get them in front of my camera. They're all I'm very away. impressed that you're keeping a, a, a colony alive for 10, uh, 10, there years, you go. 10 years. So here's the beetle. There's the adult darkling beetle. That's the, the pupil form. And then we have the larva and he's going to keep walking away. So, but they are amazing. They stay in the container. They don't fly typically. Um, they can fly, but they don't. Um, they will try and climb out, but I, I don't have them escape. Um, they're pretty easy to maintain. Um, and you just clean them out uh, every couple few months or so. And, and keep feeding them and keep, I put potato in there about once a week or so. Um, and that's pretty much all you have to do. They're, they're an, an easy insect to raise. And like I said, they're slow growing. So um, you're not gonna be overrun. Uh, is it, there's, is, is, uh, what's safe to clean the tub with? We have a lot of questions um, about mealworm raising. We might have to do a whole presentation on mealworm raising so everybody can start their mealworm There is farm. a wonderful website that gives you all the information you need. Um, if I do a class on raising mealworms, I give the kids this handout um, on raising mealworms. It's fantastic. Just Google it. Um, I have that as a handout too. Um, and they give you all the ins and outs of what you need to do. As far as washing, when I, I dump the... the um, oatmeal into another bowl, I clean the container, and then I put fresh uh, oatmeal back in, and then I put, I, I have to sift through it. So I do it while I'm watching TV or something. I sift through it and get all of the babies, all of the pupas, all of the adults out. And then you still have to put a little bit of the frass, the fine pieces that are at the bottom of your container, because that's where the eggs are and you can't see them. They're so small that you cannot see the eggs. So if you wanna keep the generations going in the same life cycle, you've gotta keep some of that frassy stuff at the bottom so that, the, so that you'll get some eggs and they will rehatch. All right. Wow, thanks. Any other <laughs> questions? I see somebody mentioned sprickets. Oh, okay. Um, I, I'm from Pennsylvania. I'd never heard of sprickets before I came to Maryland. I'm like, what in the world are you people talking about? And what they are are camel crickets. Um, we have them here. We live in an old um, 1800s farmhouse. I have camel crickets everywhere in my basement and they work their way up into my house. Um, but people call them sprickets because they look like a combination between a cricket and a spider because they have big legs, they jump. Um, they're perfectly harmless. They are, um, they like damp areas like millipedes and things like that. They would be perfectly fine to eat. There's nothing wrong with eating them. So if you really want something and you have camel crickets in your basement, go to town. You can get free some and go ahead and fry them up. <laughs> Gene, Gene had an interesting uh, connection and question. Um, if you are on a gluten-free diet, does it, does, does it matter what the insects are eating? Does it translate into the protein powder, you know, when they're making the insects and the powder? That is actually a really, really good question. And I don't have an answer for you. I do not know that answer. Um, I would have to research that um, because I don't, hmm, I don't know. Certainly a lot of the insects that we, uh, well, trying to think of, of the ones that we not, eat. This is one not. of the few ones that would be a grain eater. So most of the other ones are gonna be plant feeders, but not necessarily grains, um, the seed part. Um, so obviously the oats are the, the, the rolled grain part of the oat plant. A lot of insects that we eat 
even grasshoppers and, and things like that eat the leaves of the plant, not the grain. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you do have a gluten um, allergy or sensitivity, um, I would probably just avoid an insect that eats grain. Um, I don't know. I, that is a good research question, though. I do not know the answer to that one. Good question. I'm gonna find that out, though. Well, if you eat grain-fed beef, I guess that that would be something similar. Or no, I don't know. I would think they would process the gluten in their body, but I don't know if it would still translate. I don't know because that's a, it's a much different processing system from from a mammal like a like a, a cow or even a chicken that is eating grain. Um, an insect has a very different processing system than any of those. Um, it's much simpler. So I don't know that they would necessarily break it down. That's an excellent question. Right. If, if well, I can I jump in for one second. Please. What I was thinking with your mealworms that are being raised on oats, if the oats are not certified gluten-free as most oats are not, right. Uh, they potentially could have gluten. And if you're taking them right out of the colony, putting them in the freezer and then frying them up, their innards would have that yes. non-gluten-free yes, oats inside them. Yeah. So not that it's in, you know, it's built up in the insect, but it's in their alimentary tract. You would be absolutely correct. So again, and I mean, a mealworm is not very big. I'm not sure how much um, a, a person who is sensitive, because I don't have someone in our family that's gluten sensitive. Um, I'm not sure how much it would take. Um, so just avoid it. If, if you have a, a choice and you're looking at insects to, to try and eat, just avoid ones that are grain feeders. And everything would be fine because they don't eat grain. And Anne, uh, Anne is eating zompopos, leaf cutter ants in Guatemala, and said that they uh -huh. were delicious. Has anybody else had any other insects? They, I've had awesome. I've had mopani worms in, in Botswana in southern Africa. So that's a caterpillar from that, uh, from the mopani that tree. Excellent. Yeah, if you're ever stuck anywhere, caterpillars are a great source. Again, there's a reason that birds eat them. Um, and feed them to their young because they're highly nutritious and they allow those baby birds to grow very quickly because they're so nutrient dense. So um, there's a reason that when you look at other animals in nature and translate it to ourselves, which I, I think we should more <laughs> think of ourselves as part of the environment and, and the natural world, that's why other animals eat certain things is because they are nutritious to them. So if you're, if we're in a bind um, and definitely in a survival situation, those would be the things that you would want to go for beetles and caterpillars and things like that. Grubs. I have an interesting ant store. Oh, I gave away the punchline. If... <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> uh, so um, I was in Asia uh -huh. and uh, it was a very fancy feast. And so, um, you know, this is a restaurant, you know, they brought out all the best things. And, um, you know, there's little egg rolls that are like fried and kind of skinny, like the size yeah. of a cigar, right? And they're like, oh yeah, I bet you guys don't have these. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, that looks familiar. And then I tasted it and it was like, oh, it's like honey and sesame seeds inside. So it's like a sweet, crispy, honey, you know, like baklava kind of, right? I was like, wow, this is really great. We don't have this. It's like a dessert <laughs> egg roll. He's like, no, it's end roll. You like, you don't have end rolls there. And I'm like, end roll, like end of the meal or something like that. And I'm like, no, no, we don't. And I thought it was like white and black sesame seeds in there. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> ant roll. And I had already eaten half of the thing and <laughs> really liked it. It was like, you know, like, yeah, like baklava. And I'm like, oh. And that was my transition for bugs. I was like, yeah, I, I really liked it before I knew what it was. And then once my mind got in there, I'm like, uh. And isn't that funny? Cause that's the way a lot of people react. I think they would be perfectly fine if they didn't know what it was. But once exactly. we know, and we are not culturally set for that, um, was I just out of curiosity, if you said they were white and black, were they the lar did they have the larvae and adults in it? No, it was sesame seeds with ants. 
Oh, okay. It was part of Sesame Seed and then part ads. Like okay, white cool. The, uh, That's uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what my daughter just said is, ignorance is bliss. There you, <laughs> you know? go. And you loved it, see? <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. And, and on behalf of everybody, thank you, Beth, for, for coming and sharing um, your knowledge with us. Thank you for having me. We appreciate it. Now everybody else can go out and teach every, other people what we've learned tonight and come back. Sprinkle, and sprinkle some fried mealworms on your salad for Thanksgiving. Now you can go. There we go. Instead of on top of the green, uh, the green bean casserole, we have fried <laughs> milk <laughs> on top instead of the <laughs> the onions and then everybody have a wonderful um thank you thanksgiving. stay safe happy and, thanksgiving and come back and learn with us real soon we have a lot of cool uh, programs coming up this was great tonight thank, Ron, thank, thank you. you it bye. was great thank you thank you bye, fun. bye 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 great very enjoyable thanks gene happy thanksgiving Happy Thanksgiving, Jean. You're my regular. <laughs> <laughs> uh.